Church, we are back in the book of Nehemiah this morning, and if you have your Bible with you or maybe your Bible app, we are going to be in chapter 3 today, and we have been at this now for a few weeks. The uh, man Nehemiah writes the book to his own name, and obviously he's known in the scriptures as a man who's about rebuilding. And one of the things that he ends up rebuilding that's very famous in Jerusalem is the walls. The walls are iconic. The walls have been in Jerusalem, well, all the way back since its uh, ancient city, and the walls have been part of what makes it a special city even to this day. Uh, I've been to Israel twice, and the walls are still there in a different configuration probably than when Nehemiah built them, but nevertheless, they've expanded and contracted and took it on different shapes, but the walls have been a part of the ancient city of Jerusalem. I've got a couple pictures here. Uh, this is one of the photos. You can see we are on the top of the walls, or at least on a stairwell that goes along the walls. And imagine in Nehemiah's time, all those homes didn't exist over there. It was probably just, again, a rolling, cascading hillside. And then all the homes were actually inside the walls of the city because that's where the safety was. I've got another picture here, and it shows uh, us looking over. And I think this gives a little perspective on just how high the walls are up. If you're trying to stop invaders, you know, it can't be a six-foot wall. It's got to be something pretty tall. And that's a picture of us kind of looking over the edge, which I, I've cherished that picture for a lot of years. And then there's one more picture I have, and this is what's known as the Damascus Gate. Now, around the city of Jerusalem, there are uh, ten walls that we're going to read about in the scriptures today. Eight walls in existence today. We know that the heavenly city of Jerusalem has 12 uh, gates. I was saying walls. I meant gates. 12 gates. This is the Damascus gate that exists today. And I want to make sure you get in your mind what I mean when I'm reading gate today. Because if we think of a gate and you think of your house that has a gate that you know, goes in and out of the backyard, again, about that tall, six or eight feet tall. Uh, you think of maybe a gate that maybe lets yourself into a pasture that's kind of a, made of aluminum or steel. That's not what we're talking about when we say gate of an ancient city. A gate in an ancient city is a portal or it's a way into the city. And in the ancient city, you could close those with giant wooden doors and make the city safe at night as you didn't want riffraff coming in and out of your city. So when we say gate, that's what we mean. When we say wall, we mean something similar to that during Nehemiah's time, nice and tall and easily defendable. All right, so today I want to make sure you know where we are in the story. If you haven't been with us so far, there's three things I want you to know that have led us up to this time, and I have some pictures here for you that I think tell the story. Pictures? Do we have the pictures yet? Yep, they're there. All right, on the left-hand side, you will notice that Nehemiah has been with the king, and he has persuaded the king to let him leave from Persia back to uh, Israel and to Jer Jerusalem specifically, and the king is sent with him, not just enabling him to go, but he sent resources so that he's able to go back and build. Nehemiah arrives in the city, and this was the passage from last week. He tours the city at night and just wants to make sure he understands just what the ruin is and what needs to be rebuilt. And then on the far right-hand corner, Nehemiah inspires the people saying, hey, we can do this, let's go and rebuild the city, and that's where we are today. All right, this is the story of the rebuilding of those walls. It's an iconic story of uh, Nehemiah and his work. This is one of the longest passages in the Bible dealing with something that's built or something that's constructed. We're going to read a little snippet of it today because it's a little longer passage, but I'm in chapter 3, your Bibles are open with me. And this is the way that God records it. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers and priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zakur, the son of Imri, built. The sons of Hanasseh built the fish gate, they laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakur, repaired. And next to them, Meshullam, the son of Berechiah, son of Meshezabel, uh, repaired. I had to practice that name, by the way. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Banah, repaired. And next to them, the Tekoites, repaired. 
and their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. All right, fast forward. I want you to pick up in verse 28, same, same chapter. Above the horse gate, the priests repaired each one opposite his own house. After them, after them Zadok, the son of Immer, repaired opposite his own house. And after him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. After him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zaleph, repaired another section. And after him, Shalom, the son of Berechiah, repaired opposite his chamber. After him, Malchijah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants, opposite the muster gate, to the upper chamber of the corner. And between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. Now again, I read all of that, and those are not easy names. And one of the things that you'll notice right away is this is the kind of passage in which your, A's, your eyes just gloss over. Because you're reading this name after name after difficult name, and you're like, why is this here at all? You know, this passage today rivals for me some of the genealogies. So-and-so begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, and you're like, I know none of those names. It means nothing to me. It has no context. Why did God even put this into the scriptures? Why is it important to God that we know what the walls and the gates were that were built or what the people or who the people were that actually did the building? I'm not sure it makes much difference to us today, but I want you to hear something today. God makes no mistakes, and oftentimes buried in those obscure passages, well, there's some gold. There's some gold in them, our hills. And if you're willing to go in and investigate a little bit, you'll find out some pretty cool things about the way that God works. In order to start making some sense of this passage today, one of the things that helped me the most this week was a map. So I have a map here of what the building uh, process looked like in Nehemiah's day. The construction started all the way to the top at the Sheep Gate, and it made its way counterclockwise around the edges of the city. So that's the account that Nehemiah gives, starting at the Sheep Gate, moving to the left in a counterclockwise fashion around uh, to each section of the wall that was rebuilt. The building is recorded at starting again uh, at that Sheep Gate, and it's going to reveal to us something important to God. The passage reveals the way that God goes about building something. It reveals the values or the approach that he takes. It shows, again, his game plan for the way that he used Nehemiah in building those ancient walls. And so this is a construction project in the ancient world that was of significant value and scope. When we think about modern construction today, or at least in the recent era, one of the ones that comes to my mind is the Hoover Dam. I'm wondering how many have been to the Hoover Dam. Raise your hands. Eh, half, maybe. I can still remember the trip that my family took to the Hoover Dam. My kids were like eight and six years old. And uh, it was a great trip. I'll always remember that. But I was just you know, amazed by the scope and the size of the Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam was built in 1930, or it's, at least its construction began then under the president that gave its, its name, Herbert Hoover. It took five years to build the Hoover Dam, which I think is incredibly speedy today. It took hundred and excuse me, 21,000 men uh, to dam up the mighty Colorado River. It holds back the same amount of water that spills over Niagara Falls every day. That's what is holding back at, at, the, at the Hoover Dam. It's a 60-story, uh, essentially equivalent of a 60-story building. It has enough concrete to make a highway from San Francisco to New York. Think about that for a minute, how much concrete is poured into that. Uh, it has the unfortunate claim of 96 people who died while building it over that five-year period. And so again, a modern marvel, really, something that's amazing today in the scope of, of its construction uh, compare that again to Nehemiah's time, and obviously Nehemiah's is not nearly the scale of the Hoover Dam, but Nehemiah amazingly was able to finish his walls in 52 days, 52 days. And so how does he go about building something of that magnitude, especially in the ancient world? 
And we're going to find that out today. God uses certain strategies, and there's certain ways he goes about building things when he is going to use uh, people. He is going to use these approaches when he's building something like walls, or when he's building something like a church community, or a church building of some kind, or maybe even a Christian business. We'll use some of the things that God puts into play that we have to see here today. The components that go into building an ancient wall applies to the way that God uses humans today to build things. Now, let's make sure we note God doesn't always build using people. I think of creation. God used nobody, no person in creation. He just spoke everything into existence out of nothing became something. So again, God can always build that way. But typically, when God is building something that is using humans, he uses a certain approach. So I'm thinking again of maybe the the Noah's Ark, or I'm thinking of the tabernacle, which was the portable worship tent, or I'm even thinking about the early churches. And again, those were communities of people. God used a certain approach, and the approach that he's using here, you see duplicated again and again whenever God has people involved. So that's what this passage is about today, the approach that God takes, the values that he has, and I'm going to point out four things that God values when he uses people to build something. Four values that God has when he is using people to build something. All right, let's explore. First, God typically involves everyone. He involves everyone. There are 45 sections of the wall described, and there are names that at first, again, seem to have no significance Names that are just mainly hard to pronounce. But behind all of that, if you can see something, there's a beautiful mosaic that's being described to us. I've got a different map. I showed you the first map that had the names of the walls and the names of all the gates. Now I want to show you something else because this is rather interesting. This, rather than telling you the names of the walls, tells you the people that built the walls, all right? So you've got, and again, the orientation's a little bit different. Sheep Gate to this time is all the way to the left, and you'll notice again the men of Jericho are over there, Zakur is over there, et cetera, et cetera. All the way around, you can see who was responsible for building each portion of the gate. And what I want you to notice is that there are groups of people that are there that are tasked with building each section. So that's part of the genius that Nehemiah does is He doesn't have one group that goes through and builds all of it. He breaks it up into small teams, and those small teams are the ones that have a certain section of the wall that is their responsibility. Here's what I want you to notice. There are different groups of people. Number one, there are families. So you'll notice in the section that's all the way to your right and the the top side, you'll notice there's just a bunch of little tiny segments of wall that are being built. Well, that's where the people live because the temple's all the way over here. That's where the community is. And so you're responsible, in essence, for the section of the wall that's outside your house. And wouldn't you want that section of the wall to work well? I would. And so that's part of what he does. He says that you group of people build outside your home and build the wall there. The second group is grouped by occupation. And so there's groups of people that are goldsmiths or merchants or the priests. And they have a section of the wall that they're responsible to build. And more than likely, it is the location where those merchants actually were. And so you're building outside of your shop to make sure there's security for the city outside the place where you have your market. I have a lot of motion, motivation for that, so I'm going to help to build that. And then finally, there is a geographical group of people. And what I mean by that is there's people from outside of Jerusalem that come to help build, to build the city. That's kind of amazing all by itself. Is everybody who's Jewish within all of the geography around says... That's our city too. That's the place where we go for religious holidays. That's kind of the capital of our area. So we want to go help build that. And so people from all over, from Jericho and Tekoa and all kinds of other regions came to help to build this. Here is my point. Everyone who was Jewish had a a hand in this. Everybody was all hands on deck for it. And that was part of the genius of Nehemiah's approach is that everybody was included. You know, we have the Lord that speaks about that when he talks about his church today. Uh, In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says it this way. Now you're the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And so again, we're learning uh, in the New Testament exactly what was employed in the old in this instance is that we're all members of the body 
We all have a different function. So some are the ear, some are the eye, some are the foot. But everybody is needed and everybody has a role in making sure that the church or the people of God operate well. I can still remember when we were building the ministry center that's right across the street. And some of you have come long after we, we, we built that. And at that time, again, it was, you know, everybody had a role, all hands on deck. Some were part of the building committee. And so they were literally deciding what was going to be constructed in that space. Some were a part of the funding committee. And so they were saying, hey, how do we ask the body to raise the funds for this? Some were part of the moving committee because we had to move a bunch of stuff into the brand new building once it was built. There was all these small groups that were built. Everybody had a function. I'm going to go back a little bit because uh, there's a, a little walk down memory lane. This is a picture right here of the party that we had when we actually came together. The, the, the building project was called Building the Bless. And that was the day that the people of God came together to pledge money for the building that was built across the street. $2.2 million is what was needed in total. And that day, we came together with joy in our hearts to say, man, God's on the move. We're going to be a part of this. It's going to be so exciting. I have another picture. And this was uh, after we had had the party to raise the money. We were in the ministry center as it is now. And of course, it looks very different. But we decided we were going to be the demo team. Raise your hand if you were part of the demo team that day. Oh, it's so exciting. We all got together. Wasn't that a glorious day? I mean, I just think back on that. And it's just like, oh, it gives me a little, you know, just give me a little butterflies to think about it. We got together and we said, you know what? We're not going to give that to the pros. We're going to do that ourselves. And we got in there with sledgehammers and pickaxes. And we completely pulled down every wall that was on the inside of the building and got it prepared for the pros that were going to come in and build behind us. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful time and experience. And here's what I want you to know. Everybody played their part. And you today, if CCF's your home church, whether you're here or not, you're writing on the history and the commitment and all the participation of God's saints from the past. And every week we stand in that location at the ministry center, we're remembering God's goodness to us and the fact that God came together and used all of us for his purposes. All right, that's number one. It's a value of God. Traditionally, when he builds something, he uses all of his people in the process of doing that. Second, all work is vital but not identical. And this is so important because everybody did not have the same job or the same scope of work. Now, again, if you were going to go about that job today, you'd probably put one crew together, and they would go from section to section, and they would do the whole thing. God says, no, 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 I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to break it up, and I'm going to let different people have different responsibilities. Back to the map again. Let me show you. And if you look at the, uh, the, the scope of work, look at this. The, down there, the Hanan and his clan, look at how much they build compared to those little tiny sections up there at top. Look at the Tekoites. The Tekoites are actually that golden section right there, and they actually have another section all the way down to the lower left. So it's like, you know, what's going on here? It's not all equal. Some had a big responsibility. Some had a little responsibility. Well, that's okay, God says. That's the way I want it. I'm going to issue the work that I want done from each person. It doesn't have to be equal. It's just all significant in my eyes. And they all came together and they did a good job. Each one took one for the team. Chances are pretty good that some of those people had never built before in their lives, but here they were. It was needed at that moment, and so they stepped forward. On this idea of giving ourselves when we are needed, I have the most fantastic story. You're going to love this today. I saw this story this week, and I saw the video of this this week, and it just brought me such joy. There is a woman... She is a shot putter and a hammer thrower for the Belgian national team. So imagine this. This woman is a shot putter and a hammer thrower, all right? So you got to be a pretty large person to get that job done. And she is. On her team this summer, the one who is the runner on her team that does the high hurdles was injured. Couldn't compete. And her team would be disqualified unless somebody did the hurdles. Her name is Jolien Buomquo, and I want you to watch her doing the hurdles for her team. Here it is.
isn't that awesome? 27 seconds behind the last person. <laughs> but it's what her team needed. It's what her team needed. They were kept from disqualification because she did the hurdles. And I just look at the joy on that woman's face. I want that woman on my team, don't you? She's just, there's just like no problem. I got this. And it doesn't make a difference if I finish first or last. I just have to go out there and compete. Friends, we need to learn something from this because taking part is what counts. Even if it's not completely your jam, it doesn't make a difference. Your work is vital. Not all identical, but we do the work that's needed when it needs to get done. And the church has, well, all kinds of responsibilities for us. We've got some that make us scrumptious food. Thank you very much. I love the fact that we have great food when we're eating together. Some are arranging retreats and meetings. Some are holding babies. Some are organizing. Others are caring. Doesn't make a difference what the function is. The church needs all of those. And we are, gr are grateful when everybody's on board to give their peace because that's what makes the church function well. And so that's another thing that God really values. He values everybody's participation and giving everybody the responsibility that's theirs, that's vital regardless of how big or what the nature of it is. All right, third is diversity is a strength. And whenever I use the word diversity today, I'm quite aware that that is a hot button item. Oftentimes that word today is meant to mean it's shorthand for ethnic diversity. And of course we see that throughout I mean, all the institutions of our land. DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. That's all around us. And so when I use the word diversity today, that's a strength. Is that what I mean? Well, I don't mean just that. Diversity, when I'm using the word here today, means that it's, it's people who approach things in different ways because there's a lot of ways that we're diverse beyond simply uh, the way we look. Uh, we are diverse in the, sometimes the values that we bring or the motivations that we bring. Diversity can mean, again, something that's very physical, right-handed or left-handed. It can mean tall or short. It can mean conservative or liberal. I mean, it can mean a lot of different things, but diversity means people who approach things or value things in different ways. And one of the things that God does here is he uses a diverse group of people. Uh, this is the problem that exists in our country today is oftentimes that diversity is what tanks cooperation. So if you're looking at somebody that's not like me or thinks differently than me, I'm not working with them at all. And somehow God was able to overcome that. God was able to say, I'm going to bring this group of people together that are different in so many ways but I'm going to get them to work together for the greater cause, the greater good. And isn't that a wonderful thing that God does? Well, you're asking yourself the question, Pastor, how do you know that that's what God did here? Well, I've given you the map, number one, and it showed all the different people involved from different walks of life and from different parts of the city. So that's testimony by itself. But there's a surprise I found in the passage this week. I never would have noticed I had to actually have somebody in a commentary bring it to me because I wouldn't have known to look for it. But this is what I found out. Uh, I need to give a little backdrop in order to be able to, for you to understand the diversity here, the diversity quotient. Pastor Nick last week, which he did a great job in uh, exposing chapter uh, two to us and helping us know what was there. We found out there's three enemies of this project. In fact, this is from last week, chapter two, uh, Nehemiah chapter two. But when Sanballat the Horonite Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us, okay? So we know that Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem are the enemies. Those are the guys that do not want the project to happen. And we're gonna hear about them again next week. Well, here's what is a little buried section that you don't know, I wouldn't know. It's verse four of what I just read this week. And here's verse four. Next to him, Meshullam, son of Barakiah, the son of Meshezebel made repairs. And you're like, oh, okay, big deal. Well, guess what? Meshullam's daughter is married to Tobiah's son. So remember, Tobiah is one of the enemies. Meshullam is a guy working on the project right now, and his daughter is married to the enemy's son. Can you imagine the dinner table? Whoa, 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 whoa. And God somehow brings people together with 
even this radical difference of the way we should even approach this project and allow somehow the work to be able to continue forward. And he just manages to use people in the midst of all of those differences and difficulties for his glory and to accomplish what he wants. The natural default of humans is to refuse to work together with people who don't hold our exact view. And I think that's increasingly the polarized nature of our country. Church, that cannot be us. We need to go the extra mile in giving deference to each other, believing the best about each other. And even when we come together, maybe there's just some small things that we may disagree on, that we are participating together for the common good of what God wants to get done and what God wants to accomplish. And that happened in Nehemiah's time, and I'm increasingly saying it has to happen in our time, and it's one of the ways that we will be a countercultural agent in our uh, society today. People will see us work together, even though we may come from different backgrounds, have different economic strengths, uh, all kinds of ways that we're different. We're coming together for the common good. All right, fourth, challenges happen. There's no project of significance that doesn't face challenges. And it's common to every project. This project had it too. I don't know if you noticed it, but it was verse five. And verse five is this. Here it is. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under uh, their supervisors. So there is a group of people, the nobles of Tekoa, and we are not quite sure what their motivation is, but it's not that they don't just have some half-hearted work. It's not that they're just standing on their shovels. They say, we're not participating. You know, peace out. We're, we're not doing this. And we don't really know why. Some have conjectured that, again, these men are from Tekoa. It's a region a little further away. And it's next to one of the enemies, Geshem. And so the thought is that the nobles are somehow economically involved with Geshem. And they're afraid to build the city because Geshem might come down on them in their region. That's just a conjecture. We don't know. But these men are recorded for all time of these are the guys that did not participate. Would you want to be a part of that group? I don't. For, for all of eternity, oh yeah, you're the guys that you didn't want to, you didn't want to do it. You didn't build the walls. And again, that's what's noted here. Although we're not sure what's going on, these are the guys that say no thanks. I want you to notice it does not derail the overall project. It's just a little tiny speed bump. And if you build anything of significance, you will face challenges. I was just reminding somebody this last week that I was a part of a fairly large building pro project in Colorado when we lived there. We were part of a little smaller church. We bought some land on the edge of the city and we were creating a much bigger campus. And we had gotten the permits for that. We'd raised the money for that. It was all looking like it was just going straight ahead. And guess what? There was a report that came back that said we had a significant prairie dog colony on our land. And there are apparently some folks that, I mean, I've seen a lot of prairie dogs in Colorado, all right? But they wanted to protect the, the prairie dogs. I mean, I'm ecological, so I mean, I'm good with that. But in this case, it was going to stop the entire project. Well, here is where we ended up settling, which I thought was a very creative solution. All the environmentalists that were looking over this said, hey, relocation of the prairie dogs is okay. So we brought a truck in. This is a service, by the way. And the service brought the truck in and put a suction tube <laughs> into the hole, sucked the prairie dogs up in, and relocated them to a new home. I mean, I thought that was so clever. It was awesome. It's just a good one. I, I wish I would take pictures of that moment because I just want to relive it again. That's a fun one. There are others that were not so fun in uh, a project of, uh, in the past in church life, and I could name too many of them today. You will have challenges, but the work of God is never stopped by those challenges. It may be derailed for a time. It may be redirected in some ways, but God's path is moving forward, and those things are just speed bumps that you expect along the way. God uses Nehemiah and all the people to build the walls in the city of Jerusalem. The city had been vulnerable. It says in chapter one, the city had been filled with shame. Why? 
because it had been this crown jewel, God's presence in the city, and it had fallen under such disrepair after they were exiled because of their sin. And so they came back, and the walls were the start of restoring again some of the glory of the city. People pulled together to do what was needed. God used all the people of the city to restore the city, and even of the region to restore the city. Well, I want to close today with a story, and um, it's the story of the boys in the boat. Anybody see the movie? Yeah, again, a good number of you. And if you haven't seen that, I think it may be out of theaters even by now. Boy, when it comes out on video, I thought it was so well done. I read the book also, and I thought the book was just outstanding by a man named Daniel Brown. This is the story of the boys, 1936, that are the crew team at the University of Washington, right off our doorstep here. And these ragtag group of boys, they come from this lumber yards, and you know, it's a sea town, so they're fishermen, and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, people are farmers. I mean, they're just ragtag group of guys that live the far side of the country we don't even know about at that time, 1936. And they end up crewing to beat the best team in California, Cal Berkeley. They end up going across the country and beating the best teams on the East Coast. And they earn their way to go to the 1936 Olympics to actually face off against the Germans, and they win gold. It's a great story. It's just a, you know, the, 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 the one that's about the, the hockey team that won, you remember at Lake Placid, you know, Miracle on Ice? That's kind of what it feels like, only in a boat. Well, this is the way that Daniel Brown talks about crew. He says, the greatest paradox of the sport has to do with the psychological makeup of the people who pull the oars. Great oarsmen and oarswomen are necessarily made of conflicting stuff of oil and water, fire and earth. On the one hand, they must possess enormous self-confidence, strong egos, and titanic willpower. The sports offers so many opportunities for suffering and so few opportunities for glory that only the most tenaciously self-reliant and self-motivated are likely to succeed at all. And yet, at the same time, and this is the key, no other sport demands and rewards the complete abandonment of the self the way that the rowing does. Great crews may have men or women of exceptional talent or strength. They may have outstanding effort and perfectly uh, outstanding uh, coxmans and, and stroke oars and bowmen. But if they have no stars, the team effort, the perfectly synchronized flow of muscle, oars, boat, and water, the single whole unified and beautifully symphonic crew in motion becomes, that's what all that matters. Not the individual, not the self, but the whole. That's such an apt metaphor for the church. We can have all kinds of stars, but if they're not all working together, the boat goes nowhere. You have to have some people that are pretty gifted, but they're more gifted in relying upon God than they are in relying upon themselves. Today I've decided I want to close this service in shouting out to a group of people in the church who year after year have served us very well, but have done it with almost little fanfare or notice. This group of people takes care of all kinds of things for us, like painting the building, calling in contractors, care for people in the body. And they do it week in and week out without most of us ever even recognizing what has happened. If you are a deacon or have been a deacon of the church here at CCF or a deacon of any other church ever in your life, please stand up. Deacons meet after hours, after most of us have all completed our work day, and so have they. And they get together to make important decisions about the body. They care for people and some of their financial needs or a move that needs to happen or a leak 
but it's somewhere at the church. Next week, they're doing something very fun for us. They're actually the ones that are hosting our chili cook-off. So they're going to arrive at the facility. They're going to receive all that chili, make sure it all stays warm, and we're going to go across the street and enjoy it because our deacons are doing their work and doing their function. Friends, that's a metaphor of the body. And it's a metaphor of a healthy church when they have a group of people like deacons or other unsung uh, heroes, really, of the faith that are doing the work that they do. God builds his church using people. And the church has this distinction of being this group of people, a ragtag group of people, not the most gifted ever, but they come together in order to not only serve each other, but literally benefit the world. Today, I challenge you to marvel at the way that God builds and join him in doing it. Let's pray. Lord, you approach things in unique ways. The way that we might build something, the way you build something is really entirely different. But we applaud your way today. And we applaud the benefits of your way today. We applaud the story today that seems so ancient and filled with just names that are hard to pronounce. And yet something's there that's beautiful for us. And we, we celebrate that today. You're a God of construction, a God of work, a God of building things. And so many times you use your people to do it. Would you give us, first of all, the attitude of, of unity, the attitude of being one in Christ and being under our God, the creator of all things. Would we first of all enjoy that position and then come together in that spirit to do your will? Thank you for these things. We submit ourselves to you today. We pray in Christ's name.